He actually physically picked me up with all his head, that's how strong he is. Killing is one thing, but man, when you grab a man and drag him down to tear, so all his people can see that. Probably the first three hours was the most frightening time when I was tied up and I thought he was going to kill me. Definitely thought he was going to kill me. The following stories tell the tale of three psycho criminals that even other prisoners feared. We have an angry man who resented control and wreaked havoc while behind bars, a feared criminal and killer who lost his mind after years of isolation in prison, and a child who was tortured as a little child, only to become a hateful individual who longed to hurt others. My name's Charlie, Charlie Brunson. I've been caged up for a quarter of a century. I've spent 22 of it in solitary confinement. Prison drives me mad. Year after year after year. You gotta be mad to survive it. It gets into your blood. You start to smell prison. You eat, sleep, shit. Prison is like a cancer eating away at you. Your life is inside the belly of the beast. Come on, Charlie. He actually physically picked me up above his head. That's how strong he is. And you've got to bear in mind that while he was doing this, he was like screaming like a banshee. Charles Bronson is an infamous British serial killer. He was born on December 6th of 1952 to parents Ira and Joe Peterson. He was born in Bedfordshire and had two brothers. His early years before his teenage years were pretty normal, and he was known to be a good kid. His aunt was quoted saying, as a boy, he was a lovely lad. He was obviously bright and always good with children. He was gentle and mild-mannered, never a bully. He would defend the weak. He's not a hard man. He's very soft-hearted man. But people don't know this. They only, they only know what they read in the papers. Charles's mother recalled the sweet child she remembered from long ago. Just an ordinary child, but he was very affectionate and he used to love having little trips out and things like that. He loved going out with his dad down the park to feed ducks and things like that. It was just a normal, happy child. But by the time he was 13 years old, Charles had chosen to go down a bad path. He was part of a gang of teenage robbers and he got in trouble for stealing. The police knocked at the door one day where they'd been caught. They'd been taking shoe polish, laces, uh, stupid little things. And they used to hide them in this, this lad's shed and the police followed him this day, and that was the first time I ever known him to be in trouble. He often skipped school and enjoyed fighting. When he was in school, he didn't used to like being in a mixed school. He didn't like being in the classroom with girls. He never done uh, serious things. He just played up the teachers and got cheeky and got expelled. Eventually, Charles's parents decided that it was time for their son to have a fresh start. So they sent him to live with his grandmother in Maryside. His best friend's name was John Bristow. The worst we got up to when I used to knock around with him was going around the back of shops, pinching the pot bottles, taking the bottles back for the money. That was it, like, there was nothing really worse than that. Charles took a lot of different jobs throughout the years, but he and John remained friends. In fact, they were actually together on the day that they met two women. These women would end up being their future spouses. He was a, definitely a charmer. He was always very charming towards me and very gentlemanly. He never, you know, did anything at all. He was very, very protective towards me and looked after me and opened car doors for me. And he was really, just acted like a gentleman. Irene, the woman that Charles would eventually marry, ended up getting pregnant very unexpectedly. They were both still very young, but they believed that it was the right thing to do to get married. He said, I'm going to really settle down now. His mum and dad used to say, I was so happy he was going to get married to you, Irene, because he's going to settle down and keep out of trouble and everything, which he did do for a couple of years. Charles started to get really into drinking and would disappear for days at a time. 
When he would finally come home and his wife would ask where he'd been, he would just say that he had a really bad hangover and needed some time to recover. He was just sort of really drifting apart. We used to row all the time. and In fact, he was hardly ever at home then. And I know now that this is when he, used, he was planning the, the robbery that he went away for. While out on one of his drinking binges, Charles participated in an armed robbery alongside three other men. Even though nobody was hurt, he still ended up getting sentenced to seven years behind bars. His mother was allowed to come visit him. They allowed me down there to see him. I went with my sister and he just said to me, don't worry, mum, he says, I'll soon be out. And he was absolutely devastated. And so was I, I couldn't talk. Charles was told that if he behaved himself, he would be able to get out of prison in only about three years. The only problem was that he couldn't stand life behind bars, and he often picked fights with other inmates and sometimes even the guards. This caused him to often be put into solitary confinement. To Irene, it didn't matter if Charles did or did not get out of prison. She knew it wasn't going to work out between them, and so she decided to file for a divorce. One of his own enemies was himself. Fear of just being normal. I would say at that particular time, it was over-controlled, which was to his detriment and to his mental health and quality of life within the prison system. Charles's mental health issues caused him to get locked up and secured in a hospital. It was there that he met another resident by the name of Chris Reed. He was a very um, thoughtful person, very considerate. He genuinely cared about people. When he first went to Rome, when he was okay, he just went downhill because they put him on drugs. All interesting is controlling you by either two, either by physical or mental. The two hit it off, and it seemed as if Charles was finally making some progress. But the amount of drugs that they were giving him turned him into another person. One month, and he seemed all right. The next month we went, he'd put on nearly three stone, where they were pumping drugs into him. He didn't even look like my son when we got there. He just drugged. He was drugged all the time. We just couldn't even understand his letters sometimes. Charles would tell his family that if he tried to refuse the drugs, they would just force them upon him anyway. Some of the drugs given to him were caught dangerous. He was experiencing trouble controlling his bladder, moving would sometimes go into fits. This caused him to struggle to fit in with the other patients. One day, Charles said that one of the patients asked him for a strange favor. I said, look, what do you want, mate? You see, I wondered if you could do us a favor. I wondered if you'd hit me. I like people to hit me. So I've caught him a pinch of a right hander on the chin. <laughs> As he's going down, I've caught him with a left, the right, an upper, and another right. I sparked him out. He's out cold. As he's coming round, he went, Ooh, ooh, that was lovely. He, he lost three teeth. <laughs> I fractured his cheekbone, and he had 12 stitches in his right eye. It's safe to say that Charles had some pretty weird interactions with fellow patients, but he also acted pretty strangely himself and did crazy things in an attempt to get transferred to a new facility. At one point, he even managed to climb up to the roof. He was the first person to ever do it. Here he is, his arms raised high and wide with a victorious smile on his face as he's perched on the top. Charles's antics led him to spend even longer stints in solitary confinement. If you take somebody from a natural cage, 24 hours, 23 hours a day, and, and then stick him outside in, in the community, just drop him outside the gate and, and say, get on with it, who's going to survive? Who's going to be able to cope with that? The answer to that question is Charles. But you couldn't really say that he coped with us. He was released in 1987 after serving a 14-year prison sentence. He didn't know how to adjust to living a normal life again. He didn't like people walking behind his back because he'd been stabbed in prison by someone in the back. My husband took him over to this pub and um, he went up to the bar and the man said, how much the round was. He didn't have a clue what to give that man because he didn't know the money. He didn't know how people dressed. He did, he'd never seen traffic. People didn't seem to believe that Charles could make something of himself. In fact, before he had left prison, they had told him, see you soon.
Desperate to do something with all of his pent-up anger, Charles made the decision to go into boxing. His coach gave him the fight name Charles Bronson after the actor. Although Charlie had never seen a Bronson film, it was a name that would stick. What Charlie lacked in style, he made up for with aggression. But his lack of control proved too much of a handful, even in the boxing ring. Charles's uncontrollable rage and violence got him kicked out of the ring altogether. Now, here he was, yet again, broke and in dire need to make some sort of money to support himself. Once again, he turned to crime. He decided to target a jewelry shop in another robbery scheme. I said there was no money in the safe, that it was all in the till. He grabbed that and turned to the door, it was gone. He's an extremely large individual and could have probably uh, blown all of us over to get with me. Charlie was able to leave the shop that day with a little over a thousand pounds of jewelry, but it wouldn't be long before he was captured and back in jail once again. He only had managed to live a free life for 69 days. Lonely and longing for friendship, Charles reached out to a woman named Kellyanne Cook, whom he had met during his short time out of prison. She began to visit him regularly. She didn't seem to care about what he had done, she was just happy that he was interested in her, despite being rather demanding towards her. You have to be more perfect than perfect with him. Um, and you have to be perfect in his eyes. You mustn't have any foibles, whatever. You don't smoke, you don't drink. You always wear dresses, you never wear jeans. You have to be absolutely perfect. Kellyanne was all smiles as she remembered the day that Charles told her how he really felt about her. And then one day, he said, you know, I love you, princess. I said, yeah. We're well, all coy. And he said, yeah, I really, really love you. I should have seen it before. Charles's family didn't believe that Kellyanne was really the right answer to his problems. And then he kissed me. He'd only ever kissed me on the cheek before. He kissed me on the mouth. In public, sort of. Charles eventually asked her to marry him after having smuggled in a wedding ring for her. Although she was willing, the marriage never actually happened. This could be due to the fact that he had other female admirers at the time. In fact, he was engaged to at least four other women while in prison. Each time he thought he had finally found the one, but would end up disappointed. He's told me he's been engaged to about four different women during this time he's been inside. All he's done is written to women and they've written back to him, professed their love and all this and that, and he's took it all, you know, all for granted and, and thought, oh, everything's going to be lovely, I'll get engaged to this one, and then, of course, like, so many months down the line, after he sent them a ring and all that, they don't want him. His years behind bars were filled with anger and plenty of fights. These fights would result in solitary confinement. Nobody who has been in solitary confinement for a long period of time could actually understand what it's like. It was only when I was in solitary confinement that I used to understand why the lion paces his cage. Not because he wants to look about, it's because he's bored off his head. It's because he's got nothing else to do, he's got no stimulus. So you pace up and down, up and down, and you get to the point where you do it with your eyes closed. That's the way that you survive. You walk up and down yourself for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. The guards weren't there to try to make the horrors of solitary confinement any better. They would kick your door at night time excessively um, as you're going to sleep. Um, as a Category A prison, you have the light on all the time. Turn the light off and on, bang your flap. Their job was to make life as uncomfortable as possible and to break you, basically. Well, I've had 22 years in solitary. My eyes are so sensitive to light, you just don't realize it. And I get a lot of headaches. Because there was nothing else to do, Charles focused on working out as much as he could. This caused him to become extremely strong and even more terrifying. In solitary, Charlie has spent countless hours bodybuilding. He often does thousands of press-ups in a day and could do 25 with two men on his back. Charles had quite the reputation of being violent and angry, and nobody wanted to mess with him. People were legitimately scared of him. Nonetheless, he was still eventually released from prison in November of 1992. 
This time, he was free for 53 days before being arrested for conspiracy to rob and for breaking the nose of the boyfriend of Kellyanne's friend. The conspiracy charge was dismissed, and he was instructed to pay a fine for the nose incident. Just days later, he was arrested once more for conspiracy to rob, possession of a shotgun, and later for taking a person hostage. He was sentenced to even more time in prison. While behind bars, he would constantly attack not only other inmates, but guards, and once even a civilian education worker by the name of Phil Danielson. Phil Danielson was a local authority teacher working with inmates in a unit at Hull Prison where Charlie was being kept. I heard the door open and the next thing I knew I was on the floor. I knew I'd been thumped and really it wasn't until I heard the voice of the person who'd done it that I knew it was Bronson. I soon became aware that all these brave prison officers had scarped pretty quickly and I later found out that the other five or six inmates that were on that wing had actually gone into their cells and plot themselves in. What had Phil done to deserve this? Apparently, all it had taken was critiquing one of Charles's drawings. While the guards were too scared to come near, Charles went completely berserk, tearing up the prison and literally pulling appliances off the walls with his brute strength. Probably the first three hours were the most frightening time when I was tied up and I thought he was gonna kill me. Definitely thought he was gonna kill me. But Charles did not. This whole ordeal went on for a whopping 44 hours before he finally freed Phil. It was for this incident that he received life behind bars. The years have gone on and Charles has remained in prison. He never seemed to let go of his angry and violent ways and actually assaulted a prison guard as recent as 2014. Nevertheless, he has strangely gotten quite a few diehard fans that don't believe he should be in prison. There is very good psychological research evidence that as someone ages, the risk of violence decreases. When someone approaches 70, the, the research shows that that drops off to zero. Now, he's at that age bracket. In fact, there was even a petition asking for his release. There's no one more remorseful than him. He could come and stay at my house and I wouldn't even bat an eyelid for one minute that there'd ever be any problems that he would ever kick off. He's older now, he's 65, and he said to me last time I went to visit him, I've done 43 years in prison now, and he said, I deserved 33 of them. He said, but the last 10 years I haven't deserved, I'm ready to come home now. In 2020, Charles won a battle for the right to get a parole board meeting. But as of now, he still remains behind bars. He is 69 years old. Now, if you thought Charles was a bad guy, this next individual will shock you as well. I spent a disproportionate amount of time in special housing units for disciplinary reasons during my years in federal prisons. I was often celled up with active members of the Aryan Brotherhood while I was in the hole, and I'd hear violent tales of convict folklore. One name that came up frequently was terrible Tom Silverstein, one of the most feared and respected founding members of the Aryan Brotherhood, or as it's commonly referred to in the penitentiaries, the brand. Thomas Terrible Tom Silverstein spent 35 years in solitary confinement for the ABs. Now, some people will say he went to hell for them. Tom Silverstein was born in Long Beach, California, into a middle-class family. His mother and father divorced, and she later remarried. Growing up, Tom was shy and socially awkward. Many kids falsely suspected that he was a Jew and bullied him for that reason. This might have played into why he later developed a hatred towards Jews. Tom would get beaten up by other kids and he would return home crying. His mother told him to fight back and that if he returned having been beat up by another bully, then she would beat him herself. It was through this type of life that he came to believe that violence was the only answer. Tom Silverstein was just 19 years old when he was given prison time for armed robbery. It was the year 1975. He spent four years in prison before getting paroled. His life outside of bars would not last for long though, and he was ultimately charged with yet another robbery. This time he was sentenced to 15 years in a Kansas prison. At this point in time, Tom had connections to what is known as the Aryan Brotherhood. The Aryan Brotherhood is a neo-Nazi gang with ties both in and outside of prison. People within this gang participate in things like prostitution, drug 
trafficking and extortion and murder. The brand started accumulating enemies from other parts of the nation, namely DC Blacks, who had seen a sharp influx in the late 70s, gaining power throughout the East Coast and Midwest. Terrible Tom Silverstein picked up his affiliation with the brand during a short stint at San Quentin for armed robberies. Part of the initiation into this gang often involves conducting a hit on another enemy inmate. This was the case for Tom, who was convicted for a hit upon fellow inmate Danny Atwell. The story goes that he tried to force Danny to use hair, but he refused. The conviction was later overturned due to an informant who lied on the stand. Because Tom was known to have anger and behavioral issues, and because he had assaulted officers in the past, he was placed in a special unit, but this didn't stop him. In 1981, he was convicted of killing Robert Chappelle, a member of the DC Blacks gang. Clayton Fountain, another member of the Aryan Brotherhood, was also charged in connection with the murder. Tom was given a life sentence, but denied any guilt. Around this time, Raymond Lee Cadillac Smith was transferred to the same prison where Tom was incarcerated. Raymond happened to be the national leader of the DC Blacks gang, and safe to say he wasn't very happy about Tom killing Chappelle. He wanted revenge. The rumor at the time was that the guards at the prison did little to help to keep the two apart because they wanted to watch them go to war with one another. Ultimately, Cadillac lost the war. He let everyone know he intended to kill Silverstein, but he didn't. Rather, it was Silverstein who killed Cadillac. In a much later interview, Tom was asked about how it felt to watch Cadillac's grieving wife and child come to the courtroom for the trial. I've, I've dreamed about him for years. Just, I just see him in my dreams a lot of times. I see his wife a lot, too. I feel real, real, real uh, bad for her. How, how do you know about his wife? Well, I seen her in court. She came in the court hearing. What did she do? Did she look at you? Was she crying? What happened? Yeah, her and her daughter, I think it was. I think he's got a daughter or something. She was crying and stuff. And I was thinking, man, she looked like a real nice lady. Tom and Clayton Fountain used improvised weapons to kill Cadillac, and they stabbed him 67 times. They then dragged his body down the hallways of the prison in front of all the other cells to parade his murder in front of everyone else. Even though Tom expressed remorse for the pain that he caused Cadillac's wife and child, he didn't seem remorseful for actually killing Cadillac. He viewed it as simply taking out a bad man who hurt other people. He felt like the truth about who Cadillac really was never got out to the media. I never tortured him and you feel like he was. Oh, I'm sure he was. And he was the person who tortured not as well as you. And none of that ever came out. Did anybody ever believe your side of it? Nobody. So I, I told my story. And see, and this is another thing about the law. I brought witnesses for the last three years to testify all these events because nothing really happened that people never heard. But Terrible Tom wasn't done with his murderous rampage. On October 2nd of 1983, he killed correction officer Merrill Klutz. Tom had problems with Merrill for a long time. He said that this guard initially harassed him and had been accused of destroying his paintings. He said that his anger built up over time until it became too much. Did you see them guys in their uniforms going down through them by themselves, their gun squad and stuff? You just can't do that to people year after year after year, day after day after day, and have one of that kind of pressure and not expect something to explode. And explode Tom did when it came to the murder of Officer Merrill Klutz. He managed to trick the officer into walking ahead of him. Another inmate, Randy Gomez, passed him a knife through the bars of his cell and helped him to take off his handcuffs by giving him a key he had fashioned himself. Tom then fatally stabbed the officer to death. The prison was on lockdown for an extended period of time, and Tom was placed into solitary confinement. He was believed to be a danger to all other humans. In interviews, Tom would often allege that he was tortured and prison, and he would complain about how unfair his conditions are. In one particularly bizarre rant, he seemed to suggest that the legal systems treat women better than men. We're, we're human beings, and people with wives kill their husbands, and, and they love marriage. 
they make love and stuff. And they go off on their houses for being uh, up and see and stuff, and they expect us to sit back and twirl our thumbs. Tom also discussed how after too much time in solitary confinement, you can completely lose your mind. You know, it just gets so crazy. You, you, you no longer think about rational type of thoughts. You're just so full of hate, and you, you hate the bars, you hate, you can't go outside. And... Tom would never get to know what life as a free person would feel like again. He died in 2019 at the age of 67 due to complications surrounding a heart surgery. One of Britain's most notorious prisoners. A man whose escapades have earned him the nicknames Hannibal the Cannibal, the Wolfman of Wakefield and Brain Eater. Despite his terrible crimes, as you will see, the details of his own imprisonment might be the most disturbing thing about this case. This is a very sad case, as it shows what impact child abuse, and in this situation extremely severe child abuse, can have on the type of person an individual turns out to be, and how it can even cause them to turn into a violent killer, longing to get revenge. Robert Maudsley was born in 1953 in Liverpool. He was one of 12 children and had a pretty horrific childhood. He was routinely abused and even sexually assaulted by his own father. He spent some time away from his parents when he was sent to live in a Catholic orphanage called Nazareth. However, he would be returned to them at the age of eight. His life would include daily horrific abuse by his father that he said his mother instigated. He would be locked in a room all day and the door would only open for his father to enter to beat him with sticks and rods. He would later be put into the foster care system, which wasn't a much better life. He ran away at the age of 16 years old, desperate to provide for himself. He ended up turning to drugs and prostitution. This only led to even more horrific abuse. His mental health was so poor and his life was so terrible that he tried to take his own life several times and was eventually put into a mental hospital. His condition did not improve. By the age of 21, the urge to commit acts of violence had solidified in his mind. On the 13th of March 1974, Robert Maudsley left his home carrying a knife in his pocket. In his own words, he says, I went to the West End area. I went there to hurt someone. But he couldn't find anybody. So he ended up meeting up with a friend named Johnny. They had tea and talked and eventually Johnny went to bed. Robert got into bed with him, and the two began kissing and getting intimate. He wanted to kill Johnny, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. The next day, however, Johnny began bragging about all the men that he had managed to get to come over to his home. This caused Robert to totally lose it. He takes the knife from his pocket and stabs Johnny in the chest, killing him. He later made multiple phone calls to the police confessing the murder and was taken into custody. Because he was deemed insane, he was sent to live in a mental hospital called Broadmoor Hospital. At one point during his stay, he and another resident locked themselves in a room with a man named David Francis, a convicted child molester. In Broadmoor, they weren't allowed plastic knives, but they could have forks and spoons. Maudsley had broken the plastic spoon so that it formed a weapon, a sharp weapon, and he'd shoved it into Francis's ear. Over the course of the nine hours, they brutally tortured him to death, and Robert was sentenced to life in prison. But Robert wasn't done yet. He decided that he was on a mission to kill seven people, but not just anyone. His targets included rapists, sex offenders, and pedophiles. He was not interested in hurting anyone that wasn't in these categories. In 1978, he committed two more murders. The first was Stanley Darwood, who had committed sexual assault and murdered his wife. He stabbed him to death. The second was 56-year-old William Roberts, whom he also stabbed to death. At this point, he was deemed too far dangerous to live a normal cell life and had to live in a special cell in which appliances are bolted down and there's only a small slit for officers to pass him food. He's only allowed out of his cell for one hour a day to get exercise, and even then is accompanied by officers. He is never allowed to be around other inmates. In 2000, Robert requested that either the rules of his solitary confinement be lessened, or that he have the option to be executed. He also requested to own a parakeet, 
but was denied. He is 69 years old and remains behind bars. Even though he is referred to as Hannibal the Cannibal, it is important to note that there is no evidence that he ever ate any of his victims. This is likely just a legend. And so there we have it. Three psycho criminals who were not only deemed so dangerous that they were feared by other inmates, but also viewed as true menaces to society and threats to the human race. In fact, these three men spent so much of their lives living cut off from human life, rotting away in solitary confinement. Did they deserve it because of the criminal acts they completed? Or did the system ultimately fail them and give them a sentence that they didn't truly deserve? Let us know what you think in the comments.